Thank you very much for having us here tonight. Uh, my name is uh, Chito Vela. I'm an uh, immigration and uh, criminal defense attorney, uh, community activist. I uh, was a general counsel, a former general counsel to a Democratic state representative from uh, Corpus Christi. So I worked in the Texas Capitol for, for four years. I uh, know the Capitol, know the games, know how they're played. I'm a former assistant attorney general in the Open Records Division. Uh, and I am a community activist. I was the chair of Workers' Defense Project, an organization that fights for uh, workers and for immigrants. And I was a uh, president of Blanton Elementary uh, and Eastside Elementary School, and I've been deeply involved in, uh, with uh, Blanton Elementary for many years. Excited to be here in this beautiful and historic church. Thank you all so much for coming, and really looking forward to the debate. And Ms. Cole. Hello, my name is Cheryl Cole. Thank you for the opportunity to come and address you today and thank Reverend Chase for, uh, and the congregation at Wesley for this opportunity to be here and address you. I am an attorney, a CPA, and former Mayor Pro Tem. As an attorney, I previously worked for the Texas Municipal League, which on behalf of all Texas cities, represents them before the state capitol, so I have experience at the capitol as well as at the city of Austin. Before I went on city council, I was on the board of Planned Parenthood for two terms, and they have endorsed me, and I was also a PTA president, and I was also on the board of the Austin Urban League, communities and schools, and also was a tri-chair of an AISD bond campaign. After that, I went to serve on the Austin City Council for a total of nine years, and when I left, was uh, elected as Mayor Pro Tem the last three years by my colleagues. All right, and again, the rules here for everyone uh, who is not sitting up in those chairs under the big lights. Uh, each question, the candidates will get 90 seconds to answer. Uh, we will not do uh, rebuttals between the candidates. Each candidate will just be able to answer the question uh, as a whole. The reporters do reserve the rights for a quick 30-second follow-up if we have uh, part of your answer that we wanted to get a little more, uh, some more specifics on. Um, so uh, again, thanks to the coin toss, uh, Mr. Vela will get the first question from Saida Hassan, who I forgot to introduce <laughs> earlier. I apologize. Saida is a reporter with KUT and is helping me uh, to ask the questions tonight. Thank you, Ben. So our first question is an issue that is a hot topic in the district as well as in much of Travis County. School finance is an extremely complicated issue. If the legislature could pass something to fix a system that both the courts and lawmakers agree is broken, what would be two key provisions that you would push for? So to fix the school finance system, there, there are two issues. One is a distribution of school finance monies right now. Uh, it is not equitable and it needs to be made more equitable. The second major issue is that there's simply not enough money in the system. And to be honest, that is probably the more pressing issue. Uh, this last session, the legislature passed a budget that effectively uh, was about a $2 billion cut to the Texas public education system, and that is unacceptable. This is a complicated issue that has been the most critical issue in Texas politics for, for my entire life. What I would propose to generate more money for the public education system is, is twofold. Uh, one, I would propose legalizing and taxing marijuana and dedicating the revenues to public education. Now, I know people are not necessarily comfortable with that idea, but I would much rather tax marijuana than raise property taxes to fund schools. The second issue would be with regard to commercial valuations, the valuations of large office buildings and oil refineries. Uh, the major companies that own those properties have not been paying their fair share, and I want to make sure that they pay their fair share. Thank you, and Ms. Cole. I agree that the major issue is funding, but we have to get down to the details of the school financing formula, and I think that we have to look to finding partnerships outside of just the urban district, but also with the rural districts as the demographics have changed. 
when we talk about ways to help with the funding formula, I think number one, we can look at increases in the oil and gas tax. Number two, we really have to scour that budget which and ask where is the money going? As a CPA and former chair of audit and finance, I would commit to this district that I would do that because I believe there is a lot of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, secondly, or thirdly, I would say that uh, I worked really hard when I was on council to come up with creative ways where the local entities, the city, could actually take some of the burden off the schools of providing services for our children. I led on making that available for parent-teacher specialists and also for after-school programs. And when you do that, you take some of the recapture formula out of um, being having to be sent away. And we know that we send over $500 million away and that takes some of the money and keeps it in Austin. And that whole um, issue of partnering with the local entities to be able to reduce the amount of recapture, I would welcome the opportunity to continue to explore. All right, thank you very much. And you get the first answer on this next question as well. Um, uh, there are many problems uh, with a booming town like Austin in terms of its uh, giant growth, but what, what do you think the legislature should do to help Austin and the state's other large cities when it comes to transportation? Transportation is, I agree, a major issue facing this region, and it is one of the issues that I think we could look to having more uh, bipartisan collaboration and is actually not talked about that much. I know that we have to fight G Greg Abbott and Dan Patrick and all of the Republicans on their repulsive uh, values driven crazy ideas. That being said, the problem with transportation is not with the state, other than the distribution around the state, is getting enough money out of Washington. And that's something we should go to Washington together and argue about. I served on Campo. I was chair of the Comprehensive Planning and Transportation Committee. And we actually performed at the city detailed plans about what needed to happen in, a tr on a, in transportation in Austin, but it simply was not enough money. And on Campo, we look at the entire region. There can be more collaboration together with the state leading the effort to look at the region and our transportation um, um, obstacles. And I'm also a very big fan of rail, and I think that we should look for ways to get more funding for that out of Washington, as, as well as alternative vehicles, because we have to make a real commitment to our environment here. And Mr. Villa. When I think about the history of, of transportation in Austin, I always go back to that 2000 light rail boat that so narrowly failed, and that was a line that would have gone from North Lamar uh, down uh, Guadalupe, through downtown, and then down South Congress. And I just think about what a different city Austin would be if we had made that investment in 2000, and how that could have helped preserve so many uh, affordability in so many neighborhoods, because I think a lot of the, the folks would have really settled along that line. So in, in so many ways, uh, I, I just turn back to that uh, uh, loss uh, in 2000. Uh, what I would propose on the state level is uh, twofold. First, we need to raise a gas tax. It has not been raised since, I believe, 1991, and it is simply not generating enough revenue right now to pay for the continued uh, maintenance uh, and improvements to our highway system. I know that's gonna be very difficult to do in a, an anti-tax, Republican-dominated legislature. So what I would also propose is a local option gas tax that would levy, let's say, a nickel. You know, the city of Austin could hold an election, and any other city could hold an election to add a nickel to local gas sold in the city of Austin, and then that could be used for local transportation needs broadly defined. Public transportation, highways, sidewalks, bicycle lanes, whatever the local needs would be. And uh, you mentioned gas tax. I was going to ask this as a quick follow-up for both of you, so I will uh, give Ms. Cole just a minute or a second to respond on this, but how do you feel about the idea of, of raising the gas tax uh, to be able to pay for transportation? I support that. Okay, excellent. Um, 
And uh, now, actually, we're going to go to a question from the audience. Uh, Matt or Claire, are you back there with someone? Oh, oh yes, the microphone's right here. Sorry, Matt. Is this it? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <clears throat> The vicious cycle of poverty is rooted in discriminating practices by financial institutions. Homeowners in certain zip codes cannot find financing and loans to maintain their homes or start businesses. The areas then run down and turn into little mini ghettos, which produce inferior schools. This creates a whole new set of problems. How are you going to fix this mess in District 46? And Mr. Vale, that'll go to you, for, you first. <clears throat> The cycle of poverty is a very serious problem. The best way to break the cycle of poverty is a robust and healthy educational system. Uh, that to me is the fundamental need, the investment that we need to make in our communities so that our children have the education that they deserve and so that they can, in the future, have the economic opportunities, uh, the knowledge, the capacity to then get good jobs, be good parents, and, and do all of the things that, that, that to take advantage of the, the many opportunities that we have in, uh, in our society. In terms of financing, especially you know, home financing, there has been a legacy of discrimination in lending uh, based on zip codes, uh, based on race, and we need to stop that. The, that's primarily uh, a federal concern, but the state also has a uh, uh, banking regulations, and we should make sure and strictly enforce that. Look at data that is provided by mortgage companies and banks to make sure that they're not uh, redlining, which is what the, the practice uh, is uh, referred to as, uh, and make sure that everybody has access to the credit they need for uh, their homes. Ms. Cole. Your question hits at so many issues, and it basically is a health and human service funding problem. We have to have more funding for education, for workforce development, for post-secondary education, and we also have to help people that don't have that level of education at the, currently. And as far as the legislative fixes for that go, of course, there is uh, laws that need to be passed. And in addition to the redlining laws, there's laws that need to be strengthened at the state level for like payday lending. Uh, there's laws that need to be strengthened that have to do with um, you know, the amount of documentation that you have to provide to actually receive a loan and credit reports and my current deed says no coloreds. I mean, of course you can't enforce that, but it's just offensive that it is still there. And so there are so many things that have to have um, training to help people. And, and there are nonprofits that we need to help do that. I mean, the Urban League does an extensive amount of work for uh, home repair. Um, communities and schools does work for dropout prevention. Those are the type of programs that on the state level also need to be funded. Thank you. All right, and this next question comes from one of our KUT listeners, Matt Edison, and Ms. Cole will let you answer first. So Matt wanted to know about gentrification. Um, he specifically asked about the families, predominantly folks of color who have historically lived in East Austin. They were, of course, originally forced to live there by a racist city code, but now skyrocketing property values are pushing many of those families out. You can argue that city council has more of an effect on property values, but what do you think the legislature can do to help in this situation? It was called the 1929 Austin Tomorrow Plan. That was the plan that segregated Austin and said that African Americans and uh, Hispanics could only live in certain sections of Austin. And as we have boomed, the property values have boomed, and many of those individuals have been priced out and we see gentrification. What can the state do? The state 
can number one, help us with our education funding and recapture because that is making the property taxes go up and making the cost of the homes go up and the state has a direct role in that. The state can also help, as we discussed earlier, with transportation and transportation funding and solutions. I uh, fully support the green line from uh, Maynard and I think that we need to be on board in looking at those types of things because we could probably gain a lot of support across the state for those types of transportation solutions. All right, thank you, Mr. Vela. When I'm walking around the district talking to voters, the number one concern is affordability. The number one concern is the gentrification of uh, East Austin neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. That is, and traditionally has been, more of a city issue. But that's not an acceptable response to tell a constituent that, oh, well, that's not my problem. So I've been thinking about this issue more and more and being like, what can the state do to help Austin? Because Austin is in such a unique situation. Other cities do face uh, gentrification, but not on the scale that, that Austin uh, is, uh, uh, on the scale that gentrification is happening in Austin. So what I would propose that the state do is, build housing for state employees and state retirees. Some of the people most affected by this housing crisis and by affordability issues in Austin are state retirees because their income is fixed, but their costs, as they see around them, their costs are increasing dramatically. The state of Texas has an obligation to its employees and to its retirees to, to help them out as they age and uh, to make sure and, and take care of them. There's lots of state land downtown where there are parking garages, it's, it's underdeveloped land. Uh, I would like to explore the possibility of the state directly constructing housing for its downtown employees and for its retirees. Uh, that would also help diversify housing downtown and, and bring kind of regular people back downtown, not just kind of uh, expensive condos and, and folks that live there. Thank you. Uh, if uh, I don't know if anyone here in the audience has been to your two campaign websites, but if you look at the issues that y'all talk about, uh, there are many similarities. Uh, you know, you're both Democrats running for this seat, so you have a lot of uh, similar positions on things. So I thought this next question, this might be a little fun, uh, and we'll start with you, Mr. Vela. Uh, tell me something you disagree with your opponent about. Hmm, something I disagree uh, with my opponent about would probably be campaign finance issues. Uh, I am very supportive of campaign finance restrictions and I've seen that play out in this election where I've been outspent three to one, four to one, and I've seen major donors come in and major PACs come in and provide unlimited funds to the campaigns. I think that's a real problem in state of Texas elections. Right now, there is no limit on campaign donations for state of Texas uh, races. And that's wrong. We should put a limit on it and we should do everything possible to exclude PAC money, to exclude that type of corporate money from state politics. It's corrupting our political system and we need to clean it up. We're not going to make good policy in the state of Texas or in the United States until we get big dollar donors out of politics. Yes. And Ms. Cole, something that you uh, disagree with uh, Mr. Vela on. I disagree with Mr. Vela on the idea that we do not need an African American in the Travis County delegation. This is a seat that has historically been held by Representative Wilhelmina Delco, and it was geographically drawn, just like the county commissioner seat, just like the AISD seat, and now just like the city council seat. And if it is gone, it could probably not be drawn again. There seems to be somewhat of a premise or undercurrent that to have an African American or to have an African American seat that, that presupposes that that African American will not be qualified. And that is simply, and that's not the case. And I believe that um, the 
repugnant policies of Donald Trump uh, has been experienced by all of us Democrats, and but the African American community has experienced those for 300 years. And to come in and basically what, in my view, is target us for political extinction is wrong. May I respond to that? Well, um, we're, actually, we're, um, I think you will get a chance to respond in that we have uh, actually a, a prepared question that I think both hits at this, uh, this statement as well, so that'll give you an opportunity to, to answer there. Right, and this question will go first to Ms. Cole. Continuing along this thread of, of the history of this district, if one of you wins in November, you would be replacing one of the longest serving black female representatives who long represented a majority minority district. So as candidates of color, does your background affect how you would represent your district? Yes. Before I ever went on council, I actually have the work, the record, to show what I did with the Latino community. In particular, that involved work with the Mexican American, the MAC, and putting the MAC and the Carver together because the MAC had failed at the, the ballot box and I was on the citizens bond committee that put those together and actually went out and passed them. I also worked again on the Urban League I guess we'll presume all the African-American work that I did, but I also was a board member of Planned Parenthood for two terms and fought hard for reproductive rights. I was elected in this community at large three times by the entire community. Uh, some of the support that I have enjoyed is because of that service. Not, and it was actual service and work, not just talk about work. If we call ourselves good Democrats, we cannot put people in office that have no record of having dealt with a community as diverse as this and with these diverse demographics that has no experience with reproductive rights, has no experience or I've heard of none dealing or being a part of the African American community, very little if any um, activity in the Democratic Party. All right, and Mr. Vela, same question. Does your background as a candidate of color affect how you would represent the district? So I reject the idea that somehow because I'm Mexican American, I'm not supposed to run for the seat, that somehow I don't have a right to run for the seat. Uh, that is fundamentally an anti-democratic idea and I reject it in its entirety. <laughs> this is, this district is 47% Latino, 27% white, and 22% African American. It is a very diverse district. It is a working class district. But what unites this district is that it is quite possibly the most liberal Texas house seat. What I want to do with this district is be a voice for working class families, for liberal Democrats to be a fighter, to be an advocate, and to be a champion, not just for liberal Democrats in East Austin, but for liberal Democrats across the state. The future of the Texas Democratic Party is a coalition of black, brown, and white. There is no other way forward for the Texas Democratic Party, and if we do not embrace that of brown, black, and white coming together to fight for working families, to fight for health care, to fight for housing, to fight for education, then we are really doomed as a party. All right, and uh, next question, and this one will go to Mr. Vela first. Um, uh, both of you have talked a lot about things that you believe are district priorities. But of course, once uh, if you end up winning and getting to the legislature, Democrats are in the minority at the Capitol. And even the possibility of a blue wave across the country probably won't change that here in Texas. If elected, what would your strategy be for working with the Republican leadership and getting the district's priorities passed into law? Mr. Vailigan. So there are two areas where the interests of urban Democrats and rural Republicans 
are coming together. We have common interest with rural Republicans in terms of Medicaid expansion and in terms of education. In regard, with regard to Medicaid expansion, a million Texans could be covered by the federal Medicaid program if Governor Abbott would just accept the money. We urban Democrats need that. The rural Republicans desperately need that. In a lot of these rural counties, the only employer in the county that provides health care might be the, the school district. Everybody else, almost everybody in some of those rural counties is going to be Medicaid eligible, and we are, are denying them coverage. The, there's hospitals closing in rural Texas. People in rural Texas are not able to access maternity care, are not able to access health care. They need the Medicaid expansion. We need, in urban areas, the Medicaid expansion. I, a, a coalition can be built there of rural Republicans and urban Democrats. Education is very similar. Rural schools are suffering as much as Austin schools are. They don't have the property uh, to, to tax. They are totally dependent on state revenues, which are continuing to decline. Again, there, I think there's an opportunity for a coalition between rural Republicans and urban Democrats based on a, a, a fair and adequate school funding program. All right, and this next question, we've got another question from the audience. Oh, wait a minute. We know we still have. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. I repeat so the question because. Oh, yeah, you got it. Yes. So, uh, as Ben said earlier, Democrats are, of course, the minority at the Capitol. And should you be elected, um, what would be your strategy for working with Republican leadership and getting the district's priorities passed into law? My, one of my primary supporters in this race is the firefighters and their number one issue is pensions. And they were early on one of the groups that I talked to or came to talk to me because I was chair of audit and finance and they knew my work on the pension systems for the city. And so issues like that, that don't get a limelight, that you don't get to go to the back mic, that you don't go to the back mic, attack everybody, look for the press, but that need to be addressed because it impacts our teachers and their take home pay and working class families immensely. I would work with cross the aisle to solve. Okay, thank you. And now we will go to a question from the audience. My name is Rudy. I'm from a town a little north of here and um, my question has to do with oftentimes the representative from this district pays attention to Austin and Austin receives the lion's share of that attention and that's to the detriment of people in Maynard and Pflugerville. What in your opinions are the issues that face the citizens in Maynard and Pflugerville and how do you perceive yourselves to actually address those issues? And to Ms. Cole first. That has been the highlight and joy of running in this race is getting to know Pflugerville and Maynard a lot better. With both Maynard and Pflugerville, I think that we have major transportation issues that need to be addressed because most of those communities actually work in Austin. In Maynard, I would be strongly supportive of the Green Line and making that a reality. And in Pflugerville, it's very interesting because that community has become much, much more di diverse demographically and age-wise, and I think it has a real education, I mean, an issue with making sure that it maintains its quality schools. So again, the funding for education for uh, Pflugerville and, and Maynard, together with the nonprofits that support that, that receive funding through the states, would be a top priority for me. Maynard and Pflugerville have been a, a focus of my campaign. We've had two events uh, in Maynard, uh, and I was also endorsed by Maynard ISD Anna Cortez, who was formerly in the uh, House District 46 race. Uh, I've had one event in Pflugerville. I'm having another one on Saturday. I don't believe my opponent has had any events in either Maynard or Pflugerville. So I've been out there reaching out to the communities and uh, talking to folks out in Maynard and Pflugerville, most of the issues are the same. 
they are concerned with education, they are concerned with health care, they're concerned with housing affordability. Uh, people in Pflugerville uh, were talking about how the uh, a sub $200,000 home is rapidly disappearing in uh, Pflugerville, and uh, folks are going to apparently have to move over to the, you know, far, even farther to get uh, affordable housing. But specifically with regard to what the state can do, we need to give our urban areas, whether it's Austin, whether it's Maynard, whether it's Pflugerville, the tools that they need to manage the growth that they're experiencing. Uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, municipal utility districts and there's a lot of kind of complexities in the governance and uh, zoning issues where there's uh, uh, suburbs popping up outside of Maynard and outside of Pflugerville. Uh, that I want to make sure that the local governments have the tools that they need to deal with uh, the concerns that uh, growth is generating. May I respond? And I just want to do a, yeah, a quick follow up with you. Um, uh, specifically on have have you had events out in these communities? I, first of all, I've received the endorsement of the Pflugerville mayor, Mayor Gonzalez, and I have received the endorsement of Mayor Jonesy, and I have canvassed extensively out there, and I've went to the meetings with people out there. The only thing I haven't done is a fundraiser. All right, and as soon as I figure out the technology here, there we go. Um, uh, all right, next question does go to uh, Mr. Vela. Um, now, both of you have had years of experience working with uh, the city of Austin's government uh, on city council, Ms. Cole, on uh, some of the uh, commissions, Mr. Vela. Um, we know that progressive policies championed here in Austin are often at odds with state leadership. Uh, what can state representatives do, what can you as a state representative do to foster a more productive relationship between the state and cities like Austin? Austin has historically had a very antagonistic relationship with the state legislature. Uh, and sadly, we've lost a lot of those fights. Uh, this last legislature, we, we did manage to, to win a couple, and uh, there's going to be a big one coming up. And that's going to be around the paid sick days ordinance that uh, the city of Austin uh, just passed. The paid sick days ordinance was really born out of uh, Workers' Defense Project, the agency that I was a former president of the board. Uh, it is just a, 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 such a core value that employees should be able to earn paid sick days and be able to take care of their children, take care of themselves, and not have to worry about being unable to pay the rent, about being unable to buy groceries. That's going to be the next fight, and I am happy to uh, lead that fight in the legislature. Uh, looking forward, though, the state has a lot of land in Austin, and, and we need to work more constructively uh, with the state of Texas, the Texas Facilities Commission, in terms of integrating transportation through the Texas state capital complex, uh, in terms of, uh, of the use of, uh, of state land, in terms of I-35, and uh, I would look to a more cooperative and hopefully a more amicable relationship with the state of Texas. Ms. Cole. I'm trying to understand why you said my opponent had years of experience with the city of Austin. Uh, has he not worked on a commission or worked, but been on a commission with the it city It is of my understanding that he has been on a commission for eight months, oh, and I that apologize. was the planning commission. Mm, that's incorrect. But How long were you, did you serve on the planning about commission? About two years. Well, two years, but... Okay. Okay. Um, I would love to work with the city of Austin, especially in promoting the issue of local control. I believe that the legislature beats up on Austin unnecessarily too much. There were several ordinances that I was involved in, such as the tree ordinance, that is coming back <laughs> that I would like to have the opportunity to defend and work with local stakeholders to keep it alive. The um, relationship between the city of Austin and the state of Texas needs to have a champion that tries to get what the city of Austin wants done, done, and failing that to come to some type of agreement that we can actually keep the things that we want done, especially on the environmental level. I also worked at the Texas Municipal League where the whole issue of local control, not just with Austin, but cities statewide, is at issue. 
And we can form coalitions to keep those issues intact, particularly on tax issues. Um, the question of our ability to cap taxes and will keep the tax rate within our local control and not let the state cap it must be preserved. And those nasty bills have been around for years and I have testified against them in state affairs and there is, that is a major risk to our economy and our ability to stay uh, affordable and profitable. All right, this next question touches on another process that's ongoing in Texas and in several other states. We have a case before the Supreme Court on redistricting, and the claims being made by Democrats are that Republicans have gone too far in limiting the voting power of Democrats in general and people of color more specifically, but of course gerrymandering is a bipartisan pastime. If you are in the legislature in 2021, how would you try to shape how the new legislative and and congressional maps are drawn. And it'll go first to Ms. Cole. Well, first we must clean up Congressman Doggett's district. <laughs> that is the biggest gerrymandering mess <laughs> that has ever existed. Um, I mean, I think he's been my representative more times. Uh, I don't know, it's just a mess. I mean, there is just, we've got to fight this. And I guess on a, at a very basic level, we've got to win some more seats to get this one cleaned up. There's just no way around it. So give to those campaigns and to the party. All right, Mr. Vela. We need to move away from politicians drawing their own districts. They are going to try to protect themselves as voting populations shift. They're going to try to capture people that they want in the district and move people that they don't want out of the district. Other states have adopted a uh, bipartisan and independent redistricting commission where you just have ordinary citizens looking at maps and trying to keep cohesive communities whole, not cutting up Austin into five different congressional districts, not uh, cutting out uh, Corpus Christi, that's the, the, the redistricting case that's before the U.S. Supreme Court right now, you know, cutting out South Texas from Corpus Christi and piling it piling rural Republicans into that district and flipping another seat. We need to get back to basic principles of redistricting where the districts are drawn so that the person represents a logical and natural community, as much as we can possibly do that. Obviously, some compromises have to be made, but number one goal would be to get it out of the hands of the politicians and at the very least put it into the hands of an independent redistricting commission. All right, and the next question comes from the audience, although uh, unfortunately or possibly uh, on purpose, they did not put their name on this, um, but uh, so I will ask it for them. Uh, do you plan, and the first question, or the question will first go to Mr. Vela, do you plan to push back against efforts to pass school vouchers, and if so, how? There were efforts to pass school vouchers this last session, and they didn't go anywhere, largely because of that coalition that I was mentioning of rural Republicans and urban Democrats. Vouchers are not gonna help somebody in a small Texas town where there is no school choice because there's only the public school in that county. Uh, so I would absolutely push back against any school vouchers and I would partner with rural Republicans to make sure that that doesn't happen and to defend a healthy, well-funded, robust uh, Texas public education system. Ms. Cole. I'm a strong believer in public education and I think one of the scariest things is when we abandon it and then take money away from it to get to a private system, which is essentially what school vouchers do. I would be strongly opposed to it and argue vehemently against it. And I think you also have to work with groups like Education Austin that are there to uh, help pass public education and against those um, school vouchers. 
-hmm. All right, so shifting gears a little bit, we know that Congress has been unable to make any changes to our current immigration system, and both of you are opposed to the current state law banning sanctuary cities here in Texas. What new laws or policies would you push for on immigration? And we'll go first to Ms. Cole. I guess new policy, I mean, I, I, <laughs> Congress and our current president are making a bad nation. Our country was built on immigrants. The only two groups here that didn't want to be here <laughs> through immigration are Indians and African Americans. And I think first and foremost, we have to get back to an open door policy, whether you're from Mexico or Canada. And so those, that, those types of laws have been on the books early on. And I think we just have to revert back to that type of, of language and just agree that this is what we are made of as Americans. Um, I support uh, Austin as a sanctuary city, I did that. We worked on lots of resolutions to that effect and had um, demonstrations to that when I was on city council and I would be a part of that effort at the state level also. All right, and Mr. Vela? So immigration is an issue that is uh, very dear to my heart. Uh, I'm an immigration attorney. I handle asylum cases, I handle deportation defense cases. Uh, pro probably hundreds of times I've had a wife and children in my office crying because their father was in immigration detention and they didn't know what they were going to do without their father. Uh, it breaks my heart to see this happen again and again and we're doing nothing but hurting ourselves. The people that suffer most from the deportation machine that, that, that Trump has right now are the U.S. citizen children of immigrants. When we deport their parents, what do we expect to happen to those poor kids? We're just, we're hurting ourselves with those policies. I would fight for a full repeal of SB4. That's where we start. The state of Texas should not be involved in the immigration uh, legislation. So a full repeal of SB4, let's allow undocumented immigrants to get driver's license because that's only gonna help public safety. We want people on the road who have passed the driving test and who know the rules of the road. And then we have to defend also uh, college tuition for uh, DACA's, for uh, undocumented immigrants, in-state college tuition. Uh, that's another uh, area that, that I would fight for. All right, and now we're actually going to go to a question from the audience, Mike Conti. Hi. Um, <clears throat> climate change is a slowly unfolding emergency, and Texas is on the front line of both its effects and its causes. If elected, will you oppose new fossil fuel projects? And also, Texas leads the nation in renewable energy production, yet our politics remain steeped in oil and gas. What unique approaches would you take to move the state towards a clean energy future? And Mr. Vale will go first. So that... Texas needs to recognize that climate change is real and we need to begin taking steps to address climate change. But I have to give credit where credit is due. Texas is the number one generator of renewable energy in the nation and we have done an excellent job at building out our renewable energy system. There are lots of wind farms out in West Texas. There are lots of wind farms going up in the panhandle I was just in Corpus Christi the other day and there were brand new wind farms springing up along the Texas coast providing clean energy that creates no uh, pollution and that uses no water. We need to keep pushing forward on that and I would support efforts to continue to promote renewable energy. 
on the positive side, all that renewable energy has led to the closing of multiple coal plants in the state of Texas. So we're, we're, we're doing well on that front, but the culture still has to change in the state where we have to move from an oil and gas mentality, from that fossil fuel mentality, and really embrace the power that renewable energy has in the state, not just in terms of our wind resources, but also our, so our solar resources. Uh, those sources of energy could provide enough uh, energy for the state of Texas and could uh, effectively displace much of our fossil fuel capacity today. The state of Texas is one of the worst polluted states in the country. And we have been that way for, I don't know, at least 30 years. We worked extensively because when I was on city council on the climate protection plan, because Austin actually owns its own municipal utility system. We looked deeply at renewable energy, whether it was wind, solar, and goals for each over an extended time period. I do believe that the state of Texas given the current circumstances and changes in, in pricing of uh, our coal system is ready to start looking deeply and analyzing what we're going to do about energy over the next 50 years. And if you're not talking about looking at it over the next 25 to 50 years, you're not talking about it because the changes in that industry are so massive and so expensive that it has to be a determination that this is the way we're going to go. And the city of Austin has led that effort nationwide in examples of how to do that with the Climate Protection Plan, which uh, me and two other colleagues worked on together. This next question uh, touches on an issue that you both have been very vocal about. You both have supported sentencing reforms specifically to reduce jail times for possessing small amounts of marijuana. What changes would you make to the state's criminal justice system? And this will first go to Ms. Cole. The problem with uh, extended jail times is one, it's incredibly expensive. Now, I don't know a particular fiscal note to put on that, but the question is how much of that money could actually go for school financing? It has got to be a huge number. Secondly, is these type of small offenses take people out of being put on the cycle of a re uh, productive life force and workforce development. And we need that, not just for the individual, but also for the taxes that individual generates. So the state of Texas has a committee, the Criminal Justice Committee, and also other bills go through state affairs in conjunction with the local entities that would need to partner together to look at what would be reasonable decreases in the sentencing guidelines. And there's also been studies that show that these type of offenses for minor possessions of marijuana, they, the people that are ar arrested for them are not uh, violent. There's just, there's no good reason for that other than to simply punish a disproportionate number of people who are often minorities and keep them out of a productive circle of life. Mr. Vela, same question. It's time to end the war on drugs. It's really that simple. We need to legalize and tax marijuana, dedicate the money to education. We need to treat marijuana more like tobacco, more like alcohol, regulate it, tax it, with regard to other drugs, the harder drugs, right now, the possession of even the tiniest amount of certain drugs is a felony punishable by up to two years in prison. That is absolutely ridiculous, and we do not need to be doing that to people. Uh, a felony that's gonna affect your job prospects for the rest of your life, that's gonna affect your ability to get education, money that you should be using for your family, uh, for your personal development. Instead, you're paying uh, probation fees, you're paying attorney's fees. It is devastating to our mostly black and brown 
young men who get caught up in the criminal justice system and are just put through the ringer and come out the worse for it. All felony drug offenses, simple possession. I'm not talking about drug dealing. I'm not talking about trafficking. Simple possession of a personal use amount of drugs, a small amount of drugs should be a misdemeanor. We need to stop tagging people with felony charges for simply making a mistake on one given day. All right, now we've uh, talked a lot about, oops, let me stop that. We've talked a lot about, um, <laughs> I can't even make the clock work. There we go. We've talked a lot about uh, some of your different priorities uh, if you were to be elected and sent to the legislature, but now let's get a little more specific. Uh, we actually got a question online during the debate tonight from Rebecca Gutierrez. She wants to know, uh, what's your first bill going to be? When, when lawmakers uh, are elected, they can file all their bills for the entire legislative session if they want on the very first day of bill filing. So what's going to be the lowest number bill that you turn in on uh, uh, there at the legislature? And Mr. Vale, you'll go first. I, I, I joke that my, my number one, number two, and number three uh, most important priority is, is Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion, and Medicaid expansion. The first bill that I would file would be a resolution asking Governor Abbott to accept the federal Medicaid funds that President Obama made available that would bring health care to over close to a million Texans. This is the working poor that are never going to be able to afford $300 a month, $500 a month for some kind of health care plan. They, they simply just are never going to make enough money to pay for it. President Obama and that Congress recognized that and expanded the Medicaid program, but Texas simply refuses to participate. Kentucky has expanded Medicaid. Arkansas has expanded Medicaid. West Virginia has expanded Medicaid. It can be done in a red state, and it's time to expand Medicaid in Texas. Ms. Cole. My first bill, my first bill would be to <clears throat> provide funding and additional funding for reproductive services across the board. That has taken a hit in the past 10 years that is totally unacceptable. So I am sure that one of my first bills will be to promote reproductive services. All right, and uh, this next question will go first to Ms. Cole. This was submitted by uh, one of our listeners, Beth Garza at KUT.org. If elected, how would you make sure you and your office are reaching out and connecting to the community? Well, I think reaching out and connecting to the community is, of course, showing up, and it's showing up in your office, but it's also showing up in the community. Um, I always attend... Um, the Asian American Cultural Center Festival. I always attend the uh, most of the Halloween carnivals in the district and, uh, and have done so for the past 10 years. Uh, I, Reverend Chase knows this, he's here. I visit many of the churches in the district, especially the African American churches, but not only the African American churches regularly. I think it's important to be seen and as a part of the community, and, and not just in the celebrations. I mean, we've had some very troubling bombings. We have had some very troubling deaths of some major city uh, officials, I mean, not city officials, but community leaders. Most of those people, um, uh, Andy Martinez, I was at his funeral. I mean, I just think it's a part to, it's important to be a part of the community from ground up for everybody. Mr. Vela, how would you make sure that you and your office are reaching out and connecting with the community? There's a real desire 
in House District 46 for that personal connection, for that interaction with their uh, state representative. That has not been the case, uh, especially over the last few years, and uh, people don't feel like they have a voice. People don't feel like they can convey their concerns about the state, and that would be a, a priority for me. It's something that comes very naturally to me. I enjoy the uh, events and the meetings and the knocking on the door and, and, and being out and about in the community, uh, and I appreciate the feedback that I get. And I would say also that uh, I very much understand the history of the district, that it has had an African American representing House District 46 for, for many, many years. And I would make a special effort to reach out to the African American community to prioritize their issues, to communicate with them, and to always make sure to be available to the community at large. All right, uh, <clears throat> and now we actually have a question that we're gonna go to uh, in the audience, audience, excuse me, Jeremy Smith. Hello, Texas has some of the harshest voter suppression laws in the country, including gerrymandering, restrictive voter ID, voter roll purges, and the most restrictive law in the nation limiting voter registration. Could you please tell us how you plan to address these issues and restore voting access? And goes to Mr. Vela first. Everything that he said is true. Texas has been horrible about voter access and about promoting voting in the state. We have, as a result of that, one of the lowest voting percentages in the nation. Uh, there's that, it's, it's not really a joke, it's really a, a truism, but you know, that Texas is not a red state, we're a non-voting state. If our uh, citizens actually voted, uh, we would have a much better state government and we would have a much better U.S. Congress. One of the, when I've worked elections, I've been involved in campaigns for, for, for decades, and one of the most frustrating things that I've seen is the voter, the unregistered voter that is motivated on election day because they see all this action, they see all this excitement, and they go to the poll and they want to vote and they're told, no, you didn't register five weeks ago when you were supposed to, and I see them hang their head and I see them walk away and that disappointment is just palpable. We need to change that. We need to, especially with the modern technology that we have, there's no reason to have a voter registration deadline so far in advance, and there's no reason to have many of these voter restrictions. We need to promote voting in the state, not restrict it, and what we can't do through the legislative process, we need to file suit because there are constitutional implications to Texas denial of uh, access to voters. Ms. Cole. There is probably no stronger fundamental right that we have than the ability to vote and determine the outcome of our democracy. We have to push for online voter registration. The young people coming up now do not watch TV. They do not read the newspaper. All they do is sit up with a little bitty phone and do almost anything. And if we don't get ready for that, if we think it's low now, it might get even worse. And so and I don't think because it's so, the issue with the youth is different from just voter inability and suppression in general. This, I think, is, should be a very bipartisan issue. This, I think, is just targeted at us. <laughs> and we have to fight that on all fronts, whether it's, you know, take a year before, six months or too long, or you can't figure out the rules or go, and, you know, you, you don't have your cards, you don't have your birth certificates, you don't have, you, I mean, it's just ridiculous. You should be able to vote with so much less information, and I'm totally against that. But I think there's two different groups that need to be targeted. All right, and uh, we'll move into our closing statements just here in one second. Uh, Ms. Cole, you'll go first on that. Uh, but I wanted to put in a little plug for KUT News, who's here hosting the debate tonight. Um, please uh, visit our website, kut.org. 
hear us uh, on the air at 90.5, and uh, we uh, are your local NPR station. We do a lot of coverage on legislative issues, city council, county government, uh, environment, uh, and education. Uh, so please check us out to find out what's going on here in Austin. But uh, thanks. We, we've, we're done with our questions, so thank you again for coming out tonight. And Ms. Cole, if you will please begin with, as soon as I set the timer here, um, with your closing statement. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I uh, appreciate the opening of the facility by Wesley Church, by Wesley United Methodist Church. I look forward to the opportunity to be able to serve you. My number one issue will be affordability and how that issue also relates to school finance and property taxes and then relates to gentrification in this area. That is the number one issue that I hear when I knock on doors and that'll be the number one issue for me. And that requires looking at the school finance formula on several fronts, partnering with the local entities, especially the city of Austin, which has done some work that I was a part of, also looking at the fraud, waste, and abuse that already exists in the, in the uh, government, uh, of, at the state government, and also looking at increases in the oil and gas tax as well as taxing marijuana. Uh, I also want to work on reproductive services and have pre received the endorsement of Planned Parenthood and will work for more local control. And Mr. Bayless. It's been a pleasure to be here at this beautiful and uh, historic church. Thanks so much to Pastor Chase and to uh, Wesley UMC for hosting us. Thanks so much to KUT for having this debate. Uh, it's a great opportunity to hear from both candidates and to talk about the issues and to talk about the needs of Austin. It's, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm very excited about this race. It's been very rewarding being a, a candidate, all the conversations, all the interaction with the voters. But I, I tell you, my I, 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 Democrats in Texas, we need a rally. And this is one of the districts that can help us rally. This is one of the most liberal districts in the state. And this is the kind of district where we can have a state representative that will be a champion, that will be an advocate. Not just for liberal Democrats in the district, but really for liberal Democrats all across the state. We need a voice. I want to be that voice. Thanks to both of you for coming out, Cheryl Cole and Chito Vela. Uh, again, remember, this is an election that's coming up on May 22nd. That's Election Day. Early voting will begin May 14th and will run for a week here in Austin. Uh, thanks to my co-host, Saida Hassan. Thanks to all the other workers here at KUT that have been helping us out. Jake, who put up all the speakers and microphones for us this afternoon. And of course, thanks to Reverend Chase and Wesley United Methodist Church for having us here tonight. And thanks again to the candidates for showing up and you, the audience who I've had my back to the whole, most of the night. Thank you for being here as well.